with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Cameo appearances by pets, kids, unwitting spouses, perfect or extremely imperfect backgrounds. As we video conference our way through this pandemic, we've learned much about each other. Have we also discovered interesting differences in the way men and women keep up appearances in this era of Zoom? Nam Kiwanuka looks into that tonight. First up though, investigative reporter Robin Doolittle is with us on her recent series revealing the gendered power gap that holds women back across this country. It's Wednesday, February 3rd, and that's tonight on The Agenda. It's been several decades since the gap between men and women's wages hit the political and economic radar in Canada. And yet, it persists nonetheless. What's more, according to a new series published in the Globe and Mail, that's not the only glaring disparity between the genders at work. There is also a striking power gap that leaves women behind both in clout and money. Robin Doolittle is an investigative reporter at The Globe who led the team digging into this, and she joins us now from the west end of the provincial capital to explain. Robin, it's good to see you again. How are you managing these days? We're surviving over here. Glad to hear it. Uh, let's just start with this, because, of course, you and your team have the opportunity to basically, you know, bite into any subject at any time you want. So why this topic and why now? It sounds nuts, but we started this back in 2018. Uh, I don't try to set out to do these massive year-long projects, but it does just seem like something our uh, our team gravitates towards. Um, it was early 2018. It was just in the post-Me Too era where the conversation was starting to move beyond sexual violence to a broader discussion about gender inequities. And at the time, I was also about to take a maternity leave. So I was thinking a lot about um, motherhood and how uh, babies were going were to impact my career and also other women's careers. And at the same time, there was a scandal in the United Kingdom because BBC journalists uh, learned through uh, some disclosure laws that had recently passed in that country that they were being dramatically underpaid compared to their male colleagues. And we got to talking and thought, wouldn't this be interesting if we could try to dig into this in Canada, this issue of women in the workplace? And initially, it was very focused on wages. I think you've probably heard the statistic that women make um, 87 cents for every dollar that a man makes. But that's the overall hourly average of all women compared to all men. And I think what I wanted to know and what my colleagues wanted to know was, are men and women in the exact same job making the same money like is, is that actually like does that pay gap exist and uh, that's where the project started and it went much further than that it sure did and here's how you describe it in the pages of the globe and mail what is the power gap here we go sheldon when people talk about the glass ceiling it usually refers to women breaking through to the c-suite or president's office but the globe's analysis has found that women seem to be topping out as mid-level managers in truth the ceiling metaphor isn't a great one because the numbers don't show a hard barrier women can't cross it's more of a leaky pipeline. In many workplaces, especially universities, the leak visibly accelerates a few rungs up from the bottom. What is clear is that by the highest salary band, women are dramatically outnumbered. What does this mid-level management situation look like in practical terms? Like, where are women actually getting stuck here? So this is, I think, the big takeaway from our investigation. Um, as I said, we were very narrowly focused on wages to start, but when we started getting the data back, what we found was wages were a problem, but the bigger issue was just the lack of women. There were so many more men by almost every measure. And one of the ways that we looked at this issue was we divided up the hundreds of different organizations, institutions, entities in our data set into salary bands to see the distribution, uh, the, uh, the gender divide at different salary levels. And what was just clear as day is that there were lots of women in the lower salary bands, but at the very top, there were very few women. 
And that gap started to accelerate about halfway to the top. So what was really interesting is this idea of this the glass ceiling, like what in that paragraph it said is, I think we so often think about the glass ceiling as being in the president's office, but women are hitting that glass ceiling as mid-level managers. You can see their numbers just start to sharply decline. Um, and, and it isn't, you know, an actual just like a level that they don't pass. It, it is slow. Uh, but what's clear is that by the end, they're gone. Do you know why it happens? Well, this is the subject of recent stories and what's going to be the subject of the rest of our series over the course of the year. Um I guess there's there's two things that we've really highlighted so far. Uh, one is there's a large body of research that looks at the cultural, sociological um, barriers that women encounter. This is the stuff that you've probably heard about. You know, there's um, women are penalized for exhibiting traits that are revered in men, traits that happen to be associated with leadership, things like ambition, confidence. Um, women pay more of a price uh, for having children than men do. Um, women are penalized for success. People are, they, they're viewed more negatively. So there's all of those kind of stereotypes and biases that are working against women. But the other side of it, which was the subject of a story we published last week that I think is just really important, is the laws in this country um, that prevent gender discrimination have been on the books for decades. You couldn't add a single one that would make things better, um, you know, the experts that I'm talking to say. The problem is they aren't being enforced. It, it's very difficult if you are the victim of gender discrimination to, to find any recourse. Um, and that's for a variety of, of reasons that we get into in the piece. Okay, Robin, let's, if we can, um, somewhat briskly go through the methodology here, because people are going to want to have some sense of, mm -hmm. of uh, how you collected your information. And in fact, you, you focus only in this series so far on the public sector as opposed to both sectors as well. So why just the public sector and not the private sector? Let's start there. So this first leg of the investigation is laying down, you know, a data uh, base here that we can build off of and explore in future stories. And as you mentioned, the, the primary data set focuses on the public sector. And the reason for that is it's the only detailed workplace data that's available in Canada. Um, the first uh, leg of the story did also look at TSX companies, um, but I can set that aside for now because the, the primary one is this the, the public sector. Um, we collected, you probably heard of the Sunshine List. We've collected the Sunshine List equivalents in every province that has um, legislation. Uh, PEI, New Brunswick, the territories and the federal government don't. Um, and we focused on four key areas uh, because it had the cleanest data. It was the most comparable. That's universities, large cities, municipalities, um, the provincial government, so departments, ministries, and also public and crown corporations. These are the places that, uh, you know, handle your regional transit. They do housing, they sell alcohol, cannabis. There's, um, you know, 80 of them across the country that we collected. Um, and they're structured like private businesses, but they're owned by government. And we collected all of that information. There's records for nearly 90,000 employees at 244 different entities. And we took all the first names and submitted them to Statistics Canada. And we paid Statistics Canada to give us the gender probability of a first name. So 90% of first names in Canada are associated with a specific gender at least 95% of the time. So that's how we were able to marry these two data sets and pinpoint where the women were. Now, about, I think, 11% of the names in our database did not meet this 95% threshold. So what we did then was we did a data science analysis to identify areas of volatility. And by that, I mean, let's say there's one entity or one salary band that has a lot of unknown names where things could swing depending on, on how those people land. Uh, we identified those areas of volatility, and then we manually either researched or contacted more than a thousand people to resolve those issues. Huh. Okay, here is, um, well, here's what you found out. And Sheldon, I'm going to ask you to bring this graphic up now at the top of the third page. Here we go. And for those listening on podcast, I'll just go into this in some detail because here is what the Globe and Mail found. The graph shows that the divide between men and women who are, for example, CEOs, city managers, deputy ministers, presidents, in other words, we're talking about people high up the food chain here. At publicly owned corporations, men make up 71% to women's 29%. 
In municipalities, again, a big gender split, 93% men at the top levels, women just 7%. At universities, 76% of the top spots are male, women just 24%. Provincial governments, interestingly enough, a little more of an even keel here. It looks 58% uh, of men having the top jobs, 42% women. A little more even there. Uh, Robin, of course, uh, being journalists, we like to look at the anomaly first. So tell us, why would provincial governments be more even than everybody else he surveyed? That was, I mean, one of the most interesting things when we started getting the data back is there were huge gaps in all three of the four pillars. But provincial governments, like, across the board were, were quite even. Um, you know, that graph just looked at the top leaders, but we also looked at the broad executive level. So the key decision makers, these are kind of like the tier down below the top leader. Uh, we also looked at salary bans, as mentioned. And provincial governments were like more or less 50-50 everywhere. And their the wage gap was incredibly small. Like it was nearly identical. Um, we didn't get into, I, I can tell you anecdotally what I've heard about why. Um, I did interview uh, some female uh, deputy ministers who, who, who are the top leaders. Um, and they said that in, they found actually in their careers as governments, um, as people sort of viewing government and institutions more negatively in the past you know, decade or so, they saw more men leaving the public service for the private sector. I don't, I can't say whether that is why, but I think that that was a sentiment that I heard among some of the women is that it seemed to them it was easier to rise, that there was less competition. Um, I also think that there is just more scrutiny on, on provincial governments. Uh, that's very kind of core traditional public uh, service as opposed to say a crown corporation, which is structured like a private entity and which the public really maybe doesn't pay as much attention to. Um, and the other thing is on the wage gap side, these are jobs where you know deputy ministers are making the same amount. Um, there's not as much room for kind of extra money here or there as there might be in other types of public entities. I will say just quickly on the provincial government side, it was so even and we were so interested by it that we decided to drill a little further. And when you break the massive provincial workforce into the ministry level, that's where you see huge divides in terms of numbers, that the men are concentrated in ministries that are typically associated with male-dominated professions that pay more in the private sector, such as finance, uh, environment, energy, et cetera. I wonder if part of it is effort, because I remember even as long as 25 years ago, that far back, uh, Mike Harris made it a point to hire the secretary to cabinet as a woman. And then from almost from that moment forward, there have been there's been a real push by successive premiers to have female deputy ministers and as many as possible. Effort matters, obviously, right? I think, yeah, I think that's what I'm saying with the idea that this is much more public, that you see this layer. And I think you've seen governments respond to that by putting women in these positions. Um, I think to that point that you've just made when I, I've been asked a lot about solutions to this problem since the series is run and you need that effort. You need to make a concerted effort to diversify your staff, not just by gender, but on race with, um, you know, LGBTQ2 people, with people with disabilities. Like it has to, it, it doesn't just happen on its own. You have to make, take those steps. Okay, I'm going to ask you to humor me now because I'm going to ask a series of questions that are going to seem very bizarre. So here goes. I mean, you look at the gender gap here, 71, 29, 93, 7, 76, 20, it's huge. There are big gender gaps here. Is this a problem? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's a problem. Um, I think maybe what you're getting at is the idea of preference. Um, is it a bad thing if a woman wants to not devote herself entirely to her career, uh, which is something that people say, you know, that men uh, fetishize their jobs more than women. And is that really something that needs to be corrected in women? Or is it something that we should take a look at for everybody, including men, that maybe that's not a healthy way to live? I think what this series is trying to get at is, if you want to stay home and be with your children, that is amazing. If you want to take a job that allows you more flexibility for work-life balance, that's amazing. If you 
want to rise to the highest levels possible in your job, you shouldn't encounter barriers because you're a woman. That's what this is getting at, is the people who want to rise are, are, uh, shouldn't have to encounter additional layers um, of, of barriers that, that men don't. Well, that's what I'm what you, of course, brilliantly anticipated where my next question was gonna go because I've had this conversation with lots of people in the past and, and I've had people say to me, look, I'm not surprised that only 25% of the university presidents are women. Who the heck wants to work? What, like, yes. what sane woman wants to work 80 hours a week, most of it fundraising, most of it dealing with, with you know, professors who are annoying about this, that, or the other thing, uh, never seeing your family? I mean, on the one hand, it's a great job. On the other hand, it's a job that requires huge sacrifices. Men are prepared to, more men than women are prepared to make those sacrifices, and that's what these numbers reflect. Is that fair to say? I mean, I guess I would push back a little on the sacrifices front because I think, you know, what is a sacrifice? Is working at work a sacrifice or is working at home a sacrifice? I can say that in my own household, my husband uh, has split. We, we split. I have had two maternity leaves and we split them both. And in fact, with my second child, he took slightly more time off than me. I think it is way harder to work in the home uh, than out of the home. Like it is... It is very difficult and mind-numbing <laughs> to do that work. So I think that's one thing. Uh, I guess to what your point I would say is the project is really trying to push past focusing at the very top. Because so often when we talk about these issues, it is focused on the broad salary gap, the broad wage gap number, or you know the number of women presidents, the number of women on corporate boards. Um, what we found is that, it, yes, there's a gap at the top, but there's also a gap on the way to the top, in the middle, among all managers, directors, supervisors, senior managers, executive teams, vice presidents. It's like, sure, maybe more men are willing to work a million hours a week um, to be presidents. We can get into the socialization that happens from a young age of that, whether it's right or wrong, forget it. The point is, is that women can't get past these mid-level management jobs. And when over the course of your career, the compounding effect of making less or not rising to the same levels as a man is huge. And it puts women in really precarious situations. Um, and, you know, think of the impact on retirement. Women live longer. Um, there is more to this than just, you know, a, women don't, aren't, aren't prepared to work as much. Just to be clear, it's not my view. I'm just conveying yeah. what, I'm, what I'm hearing from others. <laughs> You're going to get letters, Steve. You're going to get letters. That always happens. That always <laughs> happens, and, I, and I'm totally fine with it. Uh, let me ask you about this, um, and, and it may be too soon to say, because after all, we've been living under pandemic conditions for almost a year now. Do you know what's changed in this since the pandemic hit? We started this in 2018, and our data is from 2017, so the 2017 Sunshine Lear year. Um, the most recent data that's available, by the way, is 2019. Uh, it, you know, there is a lag time in, in what's possible here, and it took us a year to collect all the data. And you know, Ontario bundles it up into a nice little bow and puts it on a website, but pretty much everywhere else you have to go to individual places and either FOI the data or ask for it and get it sent to you, yada, 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 transcribe it all. Um, it, it was a long process. This is a marker of where we were at before the world unraveled. And I think when you're listening to economists, they'll say that um, they're very concerned that the pandemic is going to undo uh, the modest gains that were made beforehand. So since the pandemic, at one point we saw women's participation in the labor force hit a three-decade low. Um, as there has been some recovery, women are uh, rejoining the workforce at a, a slower rate than men. Um, I think the one thing that I'm really interested in is most women that I know haven't had to quit their jobs, but they are still taking on a brunt of the unpaid work at home, mm -hmm. um, just because that's how our society is socialized. Um, and are they going to have a harder time getting promoted in future? Women already had this, this kind of unfair stereotype about them that they aren't as committed to their jobs as men. And you know, is this going to be a problem? I interviewed one woman who is a senior manager at a, at a very large bank who's 
uh, boss encouraged her to take an unpaid leave. Otherwise, um, her distracted nature at work was going to uh, show up on her performance review, a performance review that's going to follow you around when you apply for new jobs or raises or promotions. So that's going to be something really difficult to study. Um, but I think it's going to be a huge issue. And obviously, um, women are more likely to work in industries that have been harder hit. So we're looking at hospitality, we're looking at food, uh, the service industry, care. Um, there's a reason this has been called a she session. That seems like a very unfair thing for that senior manager to have told the woman you just referenced there. How did she respond or react to that? She took an unpaid leave. Hmm. So and she, uh, she's, you know, she, she, she has a great quote in the story that's basically... Like the manager also said, you know, can your husband pick up some of the, the extra work? And she said, you know, when it comes to deciding who is going to take the unpaid leave or take the kid to the doctor's appointment or go to the recital, it's not actually a question because my husband makes a dollar seventy for every dollar that I make and we need his salary to pay our mortgage. So it's not it's not a choice. And what was also interesting is when they first got together and started dating, they had similar uh, education, similar work experience, and we're making within five thousand dollars of each other. But you know, fast forward five, ten years, and that's the gap. Hmm. All right. In our remaining moments, then you have identified a problem that needs fixing. What do you want to do about it? So this is going to be the subject of future stories, but I think there's some big things that jump out. One is transparency. The biggest weapon that uh, that people have, in at least in terms of salary, is having an understanding of what they should be paid. I interviewed many women, uh, particularly at universities, who were offered positions, uh, and then they checked what their predecessor was making before them and realized that they were being offered less money than a male predecessor and were able to use that as leverage. So I don't think we're suggesting that every private company publish a list of employees and their salaries, but you look at uh, the United Kingdom where there is laws that companies with over 250 employees have to publish wage uh, gap information at different quartiles of the workforce. That's something to look at. Maybe companies uh, can provide their own employees with salary bans so people have an idea of what colleagues are making. Broader transparency in general. So, um, and not just on on the, the gender wage gap, but on representation and diversity more generally. You know, we did find in our statistics that of the very few women who do make it through, they're almost entirely white. So the solution has to make sure that we're not just fixing this one very narrow problem. The other thing, which is the subject of the story that we ran last week about the, the fact that the laws are not being enforced. So if you are... Um, if you are encountering, encountering gender discrimination at work, you can't sue in a regular courtroom. The, the body that was set up to deal with these complaints is the human rights tribunal system. And the human rights tribunal system is so dramatically underfunded and under-resourced across the country that it can take two to four years just to get a hearing. That's on average. I've interviewed people where it's taken much longer. Um, a very common thing is women are still getting fired all the time after telling their employers that they're pregnant. And you think that that's obviously not happening anymore because it's been illegal for decades. But if that happens to you, what do you do? Um, the rewards for speaking up and becoming you know, a, a known complainer, uh, they're very few, right? There's a huge risk to that. And the result is that people are, are taking settlement agreements. So the same kind of deals that were silencing Harvey Weinstein's accusers for uh, and enabling his behavior, we found are being used to resolve all manner of gender discrimination complaints, whether it's uh, pay disparity or promotion, um, sexual harassment, bullying, pregnancy discrimination. And because these almost always include NDAs, we never hear about them. And this is really obscuring our understanding of the problem. So this is another transparency issue, I think, that um, you know, we asked all the places in our data set, uh, how many gender discrimination complaints have you received? How many did you resolve with settlement agreements? And almost none uh, agreed to answer that question. So I don't think, again, we're looking for places to publish settlement agreements with people because that's obviously not going to serve either party. Um, 
But I think at least knowing that they're happening and what the complaint is, having some amount of transparency of problems would go a long way. Well, Robin, as always, you and your team have done a really fabulous job on this series, which is all available on the Globe's website. And we thank you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing some of your views about it. Much appreciated. Thanks so much. Before this pandemic, co-workers rarely saw each other's homes on a regular basis. Even socially, most people didn't have people over daily. But in this COVID era, where so much of our life has moved online, video conferencing has changed that almost overnight. It's meant different things to different people, and it turns out seems to reveal some differences in how men and women present themselves. With us now to explore that in London, Ontario, my hometown, Shauna Burke, Associate Professor and Faculty Scholar in the School of Health Studies at Western University. And Trina Orchard, Associate Professor and Undergraduate Chair, also at Western School of Health Studies. And in Ontario's capital city, Christopher Alexander, Assistant Professor at Ryerson University's RTA School of Media. Welcome to you all. So nice to have you all here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having you. us. And can I just say, since we're talking about Zoom, all your backgrounds are perfection. <laughs> 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 Thank, you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, although Zoom, and I looked this up actually, uh, Zoom was created back in 2011, but most of us hadn't heard of it until this past year, um, and it's become an integral part of our daily lives. I wanted to get a sense from all of you. Um, what do you think have been some of the benefits of connecting via video while we navigate the pandemic? Uh, Shauna, I'll start with you. Sure, and Nam, thank you so much for having us uh, today for this really, I think, interesting and, and important conversation. Uh, first of all, I'll start with just connectedness. Um, connected, connectedness has always been essential to being human, and, and of course, as humans, we have this fundamental need and desire to uh, interact and to form meaningful relationships with people. And of course, with the pandemic and the, the necessary public health measures that we are following and practicing, um, it's really been difficult to share and enjoy these meaningful in-person interactions. So while I think most people would argue that in-person connections are impossible to replace or to even replicate with technology, uh, online platforms, I think, like Zoom, have, have really restored this kind of sense of togetherness. And, and many of us have been navigating our lives online for close to a year now. And at least for Trina and I, a big part of that in our work environment has been Zoom, which, which led to our observations and in, in the article that we co-authored. Uh, we're going to talk more about that article. Um, and it is hard to imagine or to believe that it's almost a year. Christopher, I want to ask you that same question. Uh, I have a very different perspective on it. And I do agree with Shauna and Trina. Their article is brilliantly written. Uh, also, thank you for having me here. It is an honor to be here. And I think that what it has done for some people, including myself, is it allowed me to circumvent particular, like get into different rooms, have a seat at a table, for example, uh, setting up lighting and, and these kinds of things. Color correction has afforded me the opportunity to have people say, oh, let's get Chris in there. So that's one maybe hidden benefit of the uh, Zoom culture. Um, and I know for us, too, uh, as a, a production team, we've been able to get people that we might not be able to get unless they were in town. So it's also been a benefit for us. Uh, Trita, I want to ask you the same question. Sure. And I think I agree with everything else that the other panelists have said. And I think that Zoom's also enabled us to continue the flow of regular life. It's enabled our everyday work interactions, meetings, student engagements, classroom activities, and all of that to continue. It's all different in the new sort of COVID setting, but Zoom has enabled us to carry out these activities in the similar way that, that we did in the past. And so it kind of makes this precarious situation feel a little bit more normal. And, and Trina, I want to ask you the next question. You know, studies have shown that women have been disproportionately uh, impacted during the pandemic from job losses, juggling, yeah. working from home, or uh, helping their kids with online learning. Although in my household, my husband is a, the patient one, so he, needs, he does the bulk <laughs> of that because I am not patient. Um, you know, when we talk about, uh, when we look at that, what impact has Zoom had on women getting their voices heard? Has it been a leveler? 
That's a really important question. I just want to make a bit of a caveat statement at, at the outset here that the observations that are based on in that we spoke about in the article are just sort of general observations. And we're not saying that all women do one thing or all men do another thing. And I think that's important to just sort of say at the outset. But I think definitely looking at the lives of a lot of my colleagues, especially the women, they are typically the ones who remained at home with the children more, more often. And so Zoom has really, I think there's a fear that it has done a real, in, uh, in, it's been an injustice for a lot of women because it feels like it's really set them back and sort of firmly placed them in the domestic sphere more so than domestic as well as occupational. And just to build on that, um, uh, Shauna, what has what have been some of the, uh, I guess, disadvantages to this, I guess, Zoom culture that we're living in right now? Well, I think we hear a lot about Zoom fatigue is one. Um, and, you know, there was a, a recent article in the National Geographic about Zoom fatigue. It's very different. And, and uh, as noted in that article, it can be hard on the brain. Um, we're looking at these Brady Bunch boxes of, of people and um, those normal sort of non-verbal, more subtle cues that we we typically rely on and gather a lot of information from in, a, in our interactions and to feel connected um, are, are gone. And so we're really relying on words and eye contact if we can find people's eyes. Um, and that's really difficult and also really draining. Do you think that, because um, I know when we have pitch meetings in the before times, we would all be sitting <laughs> on one table and uh, people are doing multiple things because we do live in uh, a, a, a culture where you have to multitask to get everything done. Uh, do you think that employers need to be a bit more generous to their employees when it comes to like maybe having the camera on or if you do have your camera on and you're, you're on your phone, uh, checking something on your phone? I think that's such an excellent question and, and a really important consideration. Um, I know as an instructor at, at the university and teaching large classes, I mean, I never require my students to have their camera on and, and I do that very purposefully. I think, you know, the pandemic is difficult for so many reasons on so many different people. And, and we don't know the challenges necessarily that people are, are experiencing and, and facing. And so there could be very valid reasons why people don't want to or, or can't have their cameras on. And so I think that's an important an important consideration for people as well. And Christopher, uh, my kids are uh, nine and seven, I think. Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, my son just turned 10. Um, <laughs> and I know I could overhear their teachers uh, explaining different things to them, which sometimes feels awkward. It feels like I'm kind of like spying on them. Uh, but my kids mm -hmm. need me to be there. And I often hear uh, their teachers telling them to turn on mute or turn off the, uh, the camera. Um, you know, obviously you're teaching uh, much older students uh, students, what's your approach to meeting or, I mean, to teaching or even meeting over video? Well, the approach I take, I will I will admit, it's very video game centric. I am a Twitch streamer and a YouTube content creator. So a lot of that when going live with audiences affords the ability of interactivity between the presenter and the audience. So some of the things I do in the classroom is I have a live on-screen text chat where students are able to ask questions. They pop up on screen, I see them, and then react to them. So that, it, it really boils down to interactivity and engagement. And those are one of the ways that I sort of facilitate in the classroom. But a lot of what we're seeing now, particularly when it comes to uh, Zoom fatigue, my understanding is a lot to do with dopamine and really what we're accustomed to seeing on the internet. And I know we're gonna get into this, but it, it's, it usually boils down to what we're used to seeing beyond the screen and then what's going on, right? So everybody's busy, everybody's got a lot on their plate, but being able to engage with an audience, which is kind of what it's been particularly for me in the classroom, and you know, I have a slight advantage, I'm talking about video games and esports, but- um, So you have their I attention already. This, I, exactly, I have their attention already. <laughs> Are there any benefits for you as a teacher uh, teaching over Zoom? For me, absolutely. I'm able to reach out to a wider audience. I'm able to engage with students on platforms like Discord, which many gamers are already used to and a part of. So we'll run classrooms through Discord, for example, and they're used to engaging there, but they can access their, their assignments there, and I'm able to pin and post things to the group. Uh, so for me, it's actually widened my practice, I feel, in a beneficial way. And it's not the same for everybody, but for me, in my particular lane, with regard to video games and all the culture surrounding it, we are an online engaging 
uh, bi-directional culture in many situations. Um, Trina, uh, the article you wrote with Shauna for the conversation looked at some ways that men and women approach appearing on camera. One of the arguments you made is that women are more used to being looked at. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I think it's uh, a fairly well-known fact that, you know, in our patriarchal society, women and men are viewed in very different ways. And there is almost a natural aspect of our everyday culture where women are, are sexualized, uh, they're understood in very different ways in terms of their physical appearance. Physical appearance means different things. It's different relationships between how you look and your social status, perhaps your, your occupational prospects, things like that. And one of the comments that we've heard from some of our male colleagues after Zoom meetings is that not only is there the fatigue, but that part of the fatigue is about um, needing to feel sort of guarded against being looked at all the time by people that they're not used to looking at them. And in many ways, women are quite used to being looked at on a regular basis. It doesn't mean that we enjoy it, but it is part of our dominant culture. And so in that way, it's quite different for women and men. I know at the beginning you said that um, the research that you're doing has been general so far, um, but I just wanted to ask, you know, what about people who are non-binary? Where do they fit into this conversation? That's a very good question, and it's something that we don't know much about because there's very little written about Zoom and gender in general, which I think is one of the reasons why our article has received a lot of interesting attention. There's a lot of articles about Zoom and fatigue, but not so much about how we how we experience it across the gender spectrum. And uh, in conjunction with my earlier comment about not wanting to appear as though we think that women all do one thing and men all do another thing, we also want to draw attention to the fact that the article that we wrote is fairly heteronormative. And there is a wealth of other um, experiences and different aspects that I think will be really important to explore going forward. Um, I've mentioned the article a couple of times, but I'd like to read a passage from that article that you and Shauna uh, wrote. During the pandemic, the spatial distinctions between office and home are eroding because many of us now work in the places where we live. This transition may be especially challenging for men who mostly prefer clear definitions between office and domestic spaces. In light of this, one suggestion is that men may use special Zoom backgrounds as a creative way to exact a sense of control over their new work environments that no longer reflect the masculine design they are used to. Again, at the risk of generalizing, which is not what we're trying to do, um, but Christopher, since you are, <laughs> you are the only <laughs> man on this panel, um, in your view, uh, why might men change their backgrounds more than women? Uh, I don't really know much about that at all. I just know for myself, and I did read the article. It's very interesting. One thing, just with regard to the last point regarding um, being used to being looked at, there are some, in, even in my situation, who aren't afforded the ability to not think about people looking at them. So, for example, the way that I present myself on Zoom is the way that I, in often cases, must present myself in the workforce. That is, buttoned up, tucked in. Uh, yes, I do my hair. A little, you know, a little baby powder to reflect shine, all these things. But this is something that I've had to do to navigate the working world. And and that's that's an interesting element of the study itself that I was interested in um, just commenting on. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, this background in the back here, those are cedar boards that a buddy of mine, uh, his consultant, he... he taught me how to put up cedar boards because I was interested in, and as you know, as a disclaimer, I'm trained in broadcast television. So I'm interested in putting plants in the background, setting up scenes and all of this, because going back to Zoom as a tool of empowerment, there's a lot of conversation about what people see, but we should start to explore the dialogue of how we can, some in some instances, control what people see. So I don't change my background very much unless I'm in the classroom and I'm switching to a concept that, for example, I'm putting together a pitch that teaches uh, elementary school's uh, kids how to code. And I have a code-based background that I bring up contextually to show statistics about coding. Mm -hmm. um, et en français aussi, I'm, I'm working on it in French as well. But that's Again. a way that I use the Zoom and the backgrounds to transport our viewers 
into what we're trying to learn. And in my case, it's often different things, coding, as well as uh, video games and esports. I really enjoy seeing people's backgrounds, and um, I guess maybe it's uh, it shows me. I guess I feel maybe like I know them a little bit better by seeing their backgrounds. But uh, Sean, I wanted to ask you that question. Then you know, um, why might men change their backgrounds more than women? Well. I think it's, you know, one thing I will mention going back to the connectedness piece about the background and, and then something that you just said as well is I think, you know, one of the uh, possibilities with, with you know, being interested in people's backgrounds, especially, you know, for coworkers that maybe you haven't seen in person in a year, is that we do, we kind of learn about them, right? We get to see them in their, in their real kind of unedited, sometimes staged um, homes, you know, but but we're seeing um, that kind of human side of, of people and, and kind of a, um, you know, in their own homes. And sometimes I feel like we're learning about coworkers and in ways that maybe we wouldn't have prior. So in some ways, I feel like it can it can enhance that feeling of connectedness with our coworkers as well. Um, and Trina, just to go uh, on what Shauna was just saying and to talk more about the differences between um, men and women, what are some other differences of note between men and women in this Zoom culture? Yeah, and that was one of the key things that we discussed in the article. We're trying to make sense of our observation that, you know, based on hundreds of meetings, it was evident that men use the custom backgrounds much more frequently than women. And we're trying to think about why might that be? You know, I think there is the creative kind of fun kind of game piece for sure. But I think that in general, women are used to occupying multiple spaces on a regular basis. Not that there isn't a distinction between home and the office, but I think women move between different spaces more regularly. And so the shift from the office to working in domestic spaces hasn't been as much of a trans transition for them as it has been for some men. And I think that using the custom background, it's a fun thing. It's also used to hide clutter. There are practical reasons. But I think for some people, it's also a way to anchor a space and mark it as work, what it is not taking place in an office, but it's in the home. So it's a way of sort of work, workifying a domestic space. And Shauna, do you think that women self-consciously stage their homes or rooms for video meetings? Hmm. Um, I only have sort of anecdotal uh, evidence, if you will, on this, and I, I do. I think I think that a lot of uh, women do spend a lot of time thinking about um, their backgrounds, and you know, likely lots of men as well. I can speak from personal experience. My partner also teaches an online class, and he does not care what's in the background, and I'm shuffling him around <laughs> and setting things up and telling him to move his chair over a little bit. So, again, something that would be uh, worth looking into a little bit more rigorously in the future for sure that sounds like me except i'm telling my children to like <laughs> leave the background anytime the zoom <laughs> comes on they're like we're ready to perform i'm like no not right now um <laughs> chris uh christopher i know we touched on it a little bit um about video games but can you tell us a bit more about the influence of gaming and youtube on the way people approach video uh calls Amazing. So I think that's what you'll find. And a lot of my work starts to delve into this. That's the disconnect we're finding here. Back to uh, dopaminergic pathways, I'm not remembering, but with regard to dopamine, particularly gamers, uh, they're used to a certain level of engagement with the person on the other side of the screen, especially if they're watching Twitch and YouTube. And transitioning that into post-secondary institutions, some streams go on for seven hours, like awesome games done quick, where people are speed running games live in front of an audience. The audience is engaging with them. But now put that same human in front of a post-secondary lecture where I'm hearing some teachers are preventing students from chatting and interacting. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a gamer, I'm hearing these things. I'm like, ooh. I don't, I'm not sure they're aware of what's going on on YouTube and Twitch because in my classroom, the students, their interactivity is of critical and utmost importance. They need to see their questions on screen. They need to see when they're chatting, I call them out by name and say, hey, what did you mean by that? And they get it. Oh, he's talking to me. Just like what happens with this video game culture. And it's fun to talk about the playing of video games, but the cultures, broadcast, interactivity, all those things surrounding the discipline 
are what I feel can enhance classroom instruction, not just in elementary, but also in post-secondary. I want to ask uh, the, all of you this next question. And I'll start with you, Christopher, uh, to, just to build on what you were saying. Um, you know, this whole Zoom culture is new to a lot of people. And what I said before about, you know, listening, I feel like I'm spying on my kids' teachers, but there's really nowhere for me to go because I need to be around um, the kids to help them navigate the online space. Uh, but do you think that that there is a worry about being judged unfairly by how professionally you present yourself online. Christopher, I'll start with you. Well, as mentioned earlier, I have had no choice but to worry about my professional appearance my entire life. As you can see by well, how I try, I'm constantly repositioning my tie mm -hmm. for this particular engagement. But um, I'm not sure about the worry as much as it is navigating that worry. Uh, for example, in my particular case, in meetings, everybody knows when my kids are in the room because I start <laughs> speaking in French. And they're all like, oh, let's hear him. Let's hear him speak in French, right? So again, just with the gaze, we are able to create conventions that indicate to our viewers in meeting or student or otherwise what's happening right now. And the amount of care, like I hear students say, oh, whenever your daughters come in, Chris, you always get so soft and nice. And we love hearing that. And they, they, they joke about it. But I know they know that, oh, they get to see a little bit. Oh, he really loves his kids, mais en français. But they, that's a way that I can explain my life, my story, via the way that they see me. So the kids interrupting me interacting not in a, ah, just based on, you know, the way that my wife and I deal with our kids shows the students that I care about my own kids, but also shows them, hey, I care about them as well. This is off topic, but do they listen to you better in French than English? I need notes. I, don't know. I need help. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards. But Trina and Shauna, I want to ask you the same question. Uh, do you think there is a worry about being judged unfairly by how professionally you present yourself online? Shauna, I'll start with you. Um, I think it's definitely a consideration. I mean, it's it's definitely something that that's always in my mind. You know, I'm, I'm asking my kids that when I have really important work meetings to be quiet and, and be in a different room. But I also think, you know, again, there can be real beauty in kind of this humanness and, and seeing people in, in their lives and in their family lives, again, in ways that we wouldn't have otherwise. And so I think, you know, it, it's it's just real. I mean, we're all living through this pandemic and, and there's going to be interruptions. And in, in my one uh, large class that I teach, I started creating a blooper reel uh, with all of the interruptions that I was experiencing. I thought, these are too good to just delete. And, and so I, I started saying, them and putting them at the end of my lectures just for some kind of comic relief because it, it's life, right? I've got kids and pets and, and a partner. And so my house is loud. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think there can be some benefits as well. And Trina? Yeah, I think uh, I don't have any children or uh, a live-in partner, but I do have two cats, one of whom is extremely vocal. <laughs> and a number of my meetings have been interrupted by Elliot and there's nothing I can do because she is the center of my universe and we're in her house, okay? So that is often comical and it doesn't last for a whole meeting, but it's definitely, it's time away. It's a little unprofessional. However, in my classes, pre-Zoom and during, during COVID, I always talk about my cats. I talk about my home. I talk about my family, my little nephews. So I think for a lot of students, they really love to see, okay, this is her house, you know? And it's the same when they come to my office which is where my office at the university, which is where I'm talking um, from today, you know, there's a really chill therapeutic vibe and it's a, it's a really welcoming space. And I think even visually through Zoom, they can assess and, uh, and appreciate that. Um, I think one thing that is Zoom culture is exposing is kind of like the messiness of life and how human we all are. And speaking of, uh, a year ago, we saw a viral clip that uh, when it first came out, we were just like, what happened? Um, but we'll talk about it after. Sheldon, could you please roll? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider <laughs> region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> What was this going to be for the region? My apologies. 
<laughs> Sorry, we were laughing the about best. that. Um, and actually, that clip came out uh, in 2017. So it came out way before its time. And Shauna, at the time, we all thought how unusual it was for kids to run into the shot. Now we see it every day um, and we see pets. Um, how important <laughs> is it for employers and colleagues to take that in stride when kids or pets appear? I think, yeah, I, first of all, I can't believe that that was so long ago. And, and yes, you know, how how strange at the time it seemed and atypical, whereas now I feel like, you know, in most meetings that I'm a part of, there's, you know, things like that happening all the time. And fortunately, I think, you know, Trina and I work in an environment that's uh, very accepting and, and tolerating and, and welcoming, actually, I would say, in, in, in lots of instances of these types of interruptions. And so I think it's just, you know, it, it's something that we've obviously not lived through before. And um, like, you know, all of the lessons I think that, that people are taking away from this time is, is patience and understanding and kindness mm -hmm. and, and understanding that people are human. And Chris, uh, what advice would you give for people when this happens, when someone's pet walks onto the Zoom call or their ch children come into the call? Well, it, it, when it happens to me, often baby just wants to come in and say, hey, yo, daddy, what you doing? I come in, okay, vazi, vazi, or allons-y. And then they come and then they'll peek and they just see a little eye and everybody just melts. They're like, oh man, this guy, you know? So as mentioned previously, a lot of these are opportunities to show people your warmth your care, and in my case, shatter a lot of stereotypes about fatherhood, presence, and just engagement with family. You'd like to think that, you know, people will be understanding about seeing the cute pet, because who doesn't like uh, a cute cat or a cute, you know, <laughs> uh, child's face? But uh, Trina, um, in, in some situations, I think this does cause a lot of stress, because even though we're at home, we're also working from home, and there's a line that shouldn't be crossed. Um, do you think that this is a disadvantage for women? I think it's definitely gendered, and I think that looking at the observations over the last almost year of when these, when these, um, I don't want to say interruptions, but when these things occur, 99% of the time it's it's with my female colleagues, whether it's um, other professors or our staff. Um, so that's that's fairly revealing, and I think that, like you said, there is usually an initially a rather stricken look on people's faces. We've got it, you know, but then I think over time we have seen that kind of evolve to a more gradual kind of acceptance, and you know, sort of welcoming the child or the pet onto the screen because it does offer a little bit of relief and kind of comic, comic kind of nature, and also a reminder that you know what we're not perfect. And work is not really just a hard bound thing, you know, and now it's taking place in other spaces where we live. And so naturally there's gonna be overflow between, you know, domestic and work and our children, right? And our pets. So I think we've become a lot more welcoming of it, which is very positive. We've kind of touched on this a little bit, but Shauna, what is Zoom fatigue? Well, I'm definitely not an expert in Zoom fatigue, but my understanding of it is, is that, again, it, it's just this, uh, it's really tough on our psyche. It's very complicated and, and um, being, you know, communicating with people in a virtual setting or environment where, again, we don't necessarily have access to all of these nonverbal cues, you know, even just the, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody taking a breath before they're about to speak. You know, how many times have you interrupted or been interrupted on Zoom? All of these things are, are really challenging and, and hard work and I think can be very overwhelming and, and exhausting when, again, we're focusing just on people's words and, again, not having access to a lot of the ways we typically would communicate in person. And uh, Trina, we've talked about the benefits of uh, Zoom and online conferencing. It's allowed a lot of us to be able to work from home. Um, what do you think, though, that we've lost by not having in-person, face-to-face connections? Well, I think what we've lost is, you know, the scent and the feel of one another and also the, ca the casual ways that we can interact. Like I miss, you know, cruising down the hallway, bumping into my, my, my colleagues or my students just kind of accidentally. And that's such a powerful way to maintain relationships and, you know, continue the things that you're working with and just getting caught up on one another's lives. Now I think we have to do, we're all schedulers. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's either you got to pick up the phone or you got to arrange a Zoom and make sure everyone's got the link and this is the password. We have to do all that just to connect. And so I think it can be liberating and fun and it's a good way to access each other and, and it allows the work, work environment to keep going. But I think a lot of us really miss that touch and sight and, like I said, smell of, of one another and just um, seeing each other in a way that, that we're used to. Uh, we talk a lot about the after times and what that might look like moving forward. Um, Christopher, what do you think in the future when all this is said and done, uh, what aspects of video calling will we look back onto uh, on a regular world and incorporate into well, that world? What I'm excited about, just to get back to, in addition to answering the question, some of the things I've lost via Zoom is um, hidden cues of who's hip to what's going on, who's connected, and, and, and what I've gained. Well, I've lost some of the non-pragmatic non elements of the work. What is the task? Let me execute those. The other thing that I've gained is an incredible amount of time with my kids. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, both of my parents were laid off, and they had the similar amount of time that I'm now able to have with my kids. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Had this not happened, I wouldn't have had upwards of, you know, the amount of time I'm able to connect with them because my wife and I, we pretty much equally share the childbearing, the childbearing, why did I say that? No way. The child <laughs> taking care of responsibilities. My wife's going to kill me. No, love, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Anyway, so, um, so it's written. She knows. Um, so, yeah, the, some of the losses are some of this hidden corporate culture that often gets said behind closed doors. You have to really talk about the task now and the gains of the family, of course. So when this is all over, there's some of the bits that I actually kind of appreciate still. Like, hey, this is what needs to be done. Let's do that. Not, well, you, you know how Chris is. Like, that's all gone with Zoom meetings now. You know how Chris is. That stuff that used to happen, it's, it's tougher to execute. So... That, that's my perspective on it all. Anyways, it's not the same for everybody, but, you know, that's one of the things. I, I like to look at the benefits of some of these things. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights. This has been a fun and educational chat, and that's all the time we have tonight. We appreciate you uh, taking some time for us tonight on the agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was thank great. You. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021. Political polarization can lead to some very unsavory outcomes. Tomorrow, we've got the second installment of our TVO Toronto Star joint initiative, the Democracy Agenda. And we're examining the risks here for such division. Also, we'll find out how multiculturalism factors into Canada's unique democratic tradition. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.